Bom dia a todos. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a, another activity of uh, CGI, our School of Internet Governance, which has a very important mission, which is to turn that debate of high quality addressing governance, internet governance in Brazil. This is a commitment of CGI to towards all the Brazilian society to leverage and foster continuity of internet governance in Brazil to help to improve infrastructure and to promote a responsible use of this great communication platform which allows human interaction, which is today's internet in the globe. And to support that commitment, EGI, is committed to go into deep terms to address the debate about governance, to raise the topics, to address challenges in the theoretical topic as well as in the practical field. With that in mind, I am extremely happy and proud to release the International Seminary of uh, Internet Governance with a national and international speakers that will debate and talk about govern, internet governance challenges. And I would like to highlight our multi-sectorial model, putting into perspective our history into a future scenario, as well as transformations that are taking place and which will still happen. Internet is a very important central tool at everyone lives and became so relevant in this very important time throughout this pandemic time. It's highly important not only to understand how it works, but also how all decisions that are made around that topic and how that will impact our life within the society. What are the different realms of decisions? Where can we debate? What are the different fields, sectors, players? And how are all these players represented as part of this debate? These are some of the questions that we should address Address. Therefore, we'll be able to improve internet governance, to think over about different pathways, and to consider new solutions to those challenges that we face to keep and maintain an open global network as it has been suggested since its very beginning. And this is the idea from now on. With that spirit in mind, I am so glad and pleased to open this seminar, which aims to explore throughout the next seven meetings some possible ways to improve internet governance and future actions with the collaboration of different experts representing different regions of the world with a different mindset and thanks to diversity and different insights, perspectives, knowledge and understandings, we'll be able together to build up a fair, open and transparent internet to all. As an executive secretary to CGIBR, I would like to thank you all, despite being connected to all of you online, I would like to thank you all for being here today. Let me thank our attendees as well as our speakers that will collaborate highly to this initiative. I also would like to point out to all attendees that are sharing with me today this opening panel. All my colleagues in this journey, Carlos Afonso, Demi Getzko, and Cristina De Luca. Cristina is an acknowledged journalist with a wonderful journey in this topic of uh, 
technology of information, and she is also a writer at important uh, communication vehicles such as WOW, and I am uh, all honored to say that she's a great partner in the CGI trajectory and Nick.br and the Brazilian internet since the very beginning. It's wonderful to have you, Christina, with us since the very beginning of this amazing journey. So I welcome you all and I wish you a very fruitful event and I invite you all to actively participate at this debate. So let's not lose our hope. Let's be closer to our family members, partners and friends and many others that uh, together are with us in this journey. Thank you so much. And before I hand over to Christina to proceed to our debate, I would like to invite Marcio Digon, who is here representing the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, and he's an accessor of the Ministry Pontis to his opening remarks. You have the floor, Mr. Migon. Good morning, and thank you so much, Professor Glaser, for your kind words. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be able to address to this uh, important group of experts and this amazing audience. This is a traditional event which addresses internet governance in Brazil. A multi-stakeholder model implemented in Brazil became a paradigm to many countries all over. I feel so pleased to see that possibility and opportunity as this is a quite young industry, but yet we can share with those that raised that industry and who are responsible to this framework which allows several actions and new missions despite all obstacles that we had to face and still face. I believe that this event will be extremely positive and fruitful and will help all of us to reflect upon our past, our present and the future. We have uh, here intellectual people, people who are acknowledged in this field, and we have this interesting speakers line up in the internet governance field, not just today, but throughout the next days. Let me also point out that this, I'm here today on behalf of Ministry, Minister Marcos Pontes, and I feel honored to represent him here today. As you might know, our minister, he has uh, boarded in this uh, embarkation called uh, Terrestrial Hope, who has developed a great ability to listen and to work addressing all needs, trajectories in this spaceship and all those uh, dilemmas that uh, he is highly skilled to drive and to guide uh, throughout uh, Brazilian science towards national development. Therefore, I am extremely happy to be ahead of this group, which is guided by this scientist who is a state minister. And as the Internet School of Governance believes at different uh, uh, spokesmen, different uh, antithesis, thesis that also support the whole scope and philosophy of science that are part of this uh, contest. So once again, I wish you a very 
Good day, and I'd like also to express how happy we are to participate at this very important seminar. I also like to highlight that training and workshops, education, they are so important to Mr. Pontis, and we care about that. And uh, let me congratulate uh, Mr. Afonso, Professor Demi Glazer, Christina De Luca to make this seminar possible to happen. Imagine back in the 1992, without cell phone, without internet, uh, going through a pandemic. At least now we have uh, internet connection and we are able to discuss and debate uh, about different uh, possibilities. So this is exactly why we are here today and this is why we have CGI and the School of Governance. So thank you so much for the invitation and uh, count on me during this day. Thank you. Posso pegar? Por favor, Cristina. Desculpa, passo a palavra a Cristina. Muito obrigado. And now I hand over to Cristina De Luca. Thank you. Bom dia a todas e todos. Hello everyone, good morning. I am so proud of being here and I thank CGI and Nick.br for the invitation. I apologize. It happens, I'm sorry about that. So I feel honored, as I was saying, to open this governance, uh, internet governance seminar. And today, we are here to talk about the Brazilian role as part of this multi-stakeholder governance. I have been following such a development since 1992, even before we started talking about a commercial internet access. The Brazilian history about internet development starts from its commercial usage, but there is a prior history to that, which led to this multi-stakeholder internet governance as an international icon which is seen as a global paradigm for many many years we had dedicated our times to infrastructures and frameworks but principles uh, shared programs decision models they are all responsible to push that governance to a application network layer, which is our main challenge ahead. In the past, we were mainly concerned about standards and rules of the framework, but the current use of the internet, it became as similar or as important as the energy use in our digital economy, which will become even more important from now on. So, to regain that pioneerism aspect wouldn't be important if we didn't have uh, Carlos Afonso with us, which is our executive director of NUTEC and Brazilian chairman of uh, Internet Society. He's the founder of APC, the Society for Communication Progress, and he's also the responsible for CGI-BR. He's also responsible for the internet services in Brazil, and he coordinated the project of uh, ECHO 92 in the world. He has has a degree in naval engineer, engineering. He's also a master in by the Toronto University. And he's got a PhD in uh, uh, in history and uh, reasoning. Now you have the floor, and I have a question to you. 
But before that, let me introduce Demi Getsko, who is a chairman of NIC.br. He has graduated by the University of Sao Paulo. He's got also a master's degree, and he was responsible for the first Brazilian TCP connection in 1991. And he's part of CGI.br since 1995. And he was a member of ICANN for two terms. And Brazil was a very important player at ICON in the past, and it's high time that we recover such a position. And we also have in this panel Professor Harmut Glaser, who is a physicist graduated by the University of São Paulo in 1987. He was a administrative director of the uh, electronic lab. He, he was also head of the the executive department of modernization of uh, informatics and science computer by, at uh, the University of Sao Paulo. He was also an advisor and coordinator of the academic network of the state of Sao Paulo. This is a very old project, which is in the core of the Brazilian internet. He's in the treasure of LACNIC, and he works as a supporter of ICON uh, IP addresses. With that, I welcome you all. It's an honor for me to be here. I'm extremely glad to be part of this wonderful panel. I know that we had some issues in the past, but we all respect one to another because I believe that we have in our technology gene a shared interest, which is to have an open, free, and fair internet to our citizens. I believe that there are a number of challenges ahead, but I'd like to start this panel and uh, if you could uh, share your opinion about how hard it was in the past to raise a multi-stakeholder model and the importance of such a model as part of the internet history and what do you see in the future from your own perspective and I'd like to start with Carlos Afonso who is there in the very is part of the very beginning okay, of the network. Thank you, Christina. I'm no longer the chairman of the Brazilian chapter of Internet Society. I was one of the founders with uh, Takahashi, who should always be uh, someone mentioned in these discussions. The Brazilian chapter is currently being shared by Professor Flavio Wagner, who is taking us to the next step. I didn't finish naval engineering either because the last year I had to uh, leave Brazil. I am a master in economics and also finished my studies in Canada. In Canada. But just a brief review of the bio you read. I would like to start by sharing a little bit of history. The idea of working in multi-stakeholder model is no big news. Internationally, it was the consequence of the world wars. The first international agency that created a multi-stakeholder structure was the Labor International Organization, International Labor Organization, ILO, which was based on the Versailles Pact. Countries just after the First World War got together to draft a pact, an agreement, and as such, they created the ILO, the first three-party organization where there were workers, the uh, employers, and the government, which was the pioneer of all future multi-stakeholder organizations. The Bill of Human Rights from 1948 also resulted from that. So after the Treaty of Versailles, and then came the Second World War and the Bill of Human Rights, 
So you see, all these participatory constructions resulted from disasters that the humanity has inflicted in its own beams. Therefore, the idea of working as a multi-stakeholder in nature is not new at all. Now, taking a leap into the future, in the beginning of the 80s, when we created the Brazilian Institute of Economic and Social Analysis, and I have to tell you, and, and maybe I'm not running any risk by saying that, at that time, I brought an Apple II in my II, own package. And with this Apple II, é, com, we started working. Com, I smuggled it into the fizemos, country. And we started Brasil. then developing the idea that I had had when I were Oi? abroad. Hello? I'm sorry? É, é. É, que foi é, a ideia de democratizar a informação para democratizar so the a idea was to have a, a partir daí, o sharing of information so that we have a democratic society. Cultural, e também com a ideia de usar it involves social, culture, other issues, and also Esse technology. Um you have a democratic a access criamos, to information. And this was really the seed to creating Alternat, the first non-commercial internet availability device. In 1990, many players started Trusting us, some governments, including, they knew what we were doing in communication, using computing resources, computer networks, and all of that, and they wanted us to come up with a way for them to be part of ECHO 92 and to do it remotely because most of them wouldn't be able to come to Rio to be here um, just live. And then we started in how we could really uh, start bringing e internet um into Brazil. Nós, é, of course, we had to deal with the government, which believed it was illegal to use a communication protocol, which was not the pattern at that time. But we managed to uh, really introduce in the agreement an agreement between Brazil and the UN, the idea of bringing connections and internet, TCP, TCP IP, in the three main sites of the conference. So we had civil society, we had the journalists, and the government which was the center in uh, Rio Center. And this, this was one of the ways, considering also the academia, the academia and what was being done, we finally put it in place, and with that, internet connections started being provided in Brazil permanently. Because uh, there is no way back, right? Once you do it, there is no going back. It, it just moves ahead. So it all started from the 1992 World Summit in Rio. But at the same time, we had a concern of how to manage that. So government, civil society, academia, primarily academia really concerned so that's when we started discussing what we do to manage that. 
And it was a multi-stakeholder discussion. It involved members of the Ministry of Science and Technology from that time, which were really instrumental. The Ministry of Communication, which also had a very excellent role. And together, we got to a consensus. We needed an internet management committee. That was the name. The name was not internet governance. We hadn't heard about governance yet. Nobody had heard about governance yet. And uh, this is what happened, and Christina probably recalls we had a, a, a uh, dinner, Sergio, Sergio and others, Ministry of Communication and others gathered, and everyone was convinced that we had to create the Internet Management Committee, starting together with a regulation which defined Internet as being something separated from telecom regulation. It offered added value. To some extent, would be uh, just trying to regulate what is transmitted through a fax machine, a fax simile, for example. So this was the inception of the multi-stakeholder Internet Management Committee. Nothing of that kind had been done yet in the world. Some years later, because this was 2003, right? Years later, we moved even ahead because then non-governmental agencies would also join us uh, in this committee, just in a very open process. And this has been the case so far. This process has been in place for 26 years, and in 2006, we created a structure that had uh, there was a legal entity, which is NIC.PR, which served to just set in operation all these strategic actions of uh, the managing committee, CGI. CGI is not a legal entity, so NIC.PR is a not-for-profit uh, private social organization, and it's self-sustainable because it gets resources from the distribution of .br domain, the Brazilian internet domains, and also the resources of coordinating IP numbers assigned to Brazil. Another important characteristic of this multi-stakeholder structure is that right from the beginning we had the term that .br would be the country's identity in internet. And it would be a common, uh, as it wouldn't be a commodity, something to be commercialized. It would be a common uh, asset. Many other countries simply sold their identity and domain to the market. .st does not represent uh, Santo Domingo Prince. It can be any domain, provided that you can buy it. TV.tv, Tuvalu, is a generic domain. And .pi doesn't happen. Other countries are like that. .ca, for example, uh, from Canada. On St. Thomas and Prince, right? But when these achievements are finally reached, it seemed to be something mundane. However, today we can really put it to perspective and realize how important all these achievements have been. Because CGI.br has already had five presidents uh, ruled under it. So, uh, <laughs> Fernando Henrique Cardoso, 
Né? E nós then, uh, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, then Michel Temer, Lula, then Michel Temer and uh, Dilma Rousseff, and now Jair Bolsonaro. So regardless of who, of who the president of the country is, we have been doing our work and we have been striving and succeeding by adopting a very advanced structure where we have traffic exchange points in the main cities of the country. In Sao Paulo, we have the largest traffic ever in the planet. Just for you to understand what it means in terms of achievement. All of that managed self-sufficiently without relying on public resources or governmental resources. So these achievements have to be celebrated. Always working within the understanding of a multi-stakeholder process. In 2015, Professor Virgilio, Demi, and I published a article in E-Triple-E about multi-stakeholder model, where we describe the models and show that it's not just a matter of governance or internet governance. It's also governance of a number of other elements and issues. For example, in regulating telecom, there is Anatel, which is a Brazilian agency that regulates uh, communication, but started after CGI. Anatel is a multi-stakeholder model as well, uh, but not quite. It does have multi-stakeholder characteristics in some moments of its activities. So, uh, public hearings, for example, which are considered by the regulator, or because of the pressure that other industries place on it. Are all industries equally represented? No, not really. Of course, multi-stakeholder uh, models are not perfect. But they are important, nevertheless, because they are spaces where we can have participation. Anatel has just approved the use of 1,200 MHz is 6 gigahertz for unlicensed use, which is a very important achievement. And you have no idea what it means if you work for community network, local access, and others. This has also been the result of public hearings, where we had large carriers, operators, and also the society. The small service providers were also involved. Therefore, this is the best way to create policies based on consensus. I still say we, even though I'm not from CGI anymore, because I feel I still belong. We are a reference model, and we are just so bold that in 2009 we published the 10 principles of the use and governance of the internet, that we wanted to use ourselves and also wanted the society to use them at large to define what to do in each specific situation. Foi uma coisa impressionante porque o mundo não tinha conhecimento. The world still had no knowledge of this kind of action. Uh, so these principles were the first to be enacted in the world, the first country that ever uh, tried to do it. Uh, we did it, and it served as a, the inception of our internet framework, legal framework. So it took us five years to finally have it published. Because of how it all started and the impact they all had, they should always be used as a reference. And it serves to a number of other actions between the government and the society at all different arenas. Well, I could go on and on, but uh, of course I want my friends also to have a chance to speak, and then I'll sure make more comments later. Thank you very much, Carlos Alberto. Now let me invite Demi. 
We know that Internet has been expanded throughout the world because of consensus. CA talked about creating in councils, uh, a consensus of governance, but I think that technically speaking, consensus have also been important. So I'd like to hear your experience and about the management of all these, let's say, infrastructure that we use and nobody has a chance to see. Good morning. Thank you very much, Christina. It's very good to see you again after um, a long time. We end up uh, getting together in different forums, but you have been with us since the very beginning, such as uh, CA, Glasser, and myself. I'm going to give you a very brief understanding, differently from what uh, CA has just, because it takes uh, the broader understanding of the civil society, because I, I've i come from the academia, and in 1991, I finally real, realized the role I had to play. I went to FAPESPI, the uh, research investment and funding agency, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Gassati at that time realized realized that uh, we had to connect the Brazil, uh, the Sao Paulo universities to uh, different uh, centers. And I had just joined FAPASPI. I was responsible for data processing. And he said, well, do something. I don't think it's good for the universities to work independently and have an inappropriate connection. I think it would be appropriate if FAPASPI, the Sao Paulo agency, could do it. And then we would come up with a more efficient and broader solution. At that time, I had brought Gomiri, a very nice person, and uh, he was uh, just visiting it. And I, in a meeting, I knew about it. Uh, in a meeting, I learned about other initiatives of uh, uh, medicine uh, networks and others. I knew there were some initiatives in academic networks as well. I got to know Alexander Grossword at that time. Takahashi was very involved, my constant. And during this meeting, we decided we were going to do it. It, is, it was in 1987 to interconnect Brazilian in academic network. In 1988, there were two connections, LCC, just uh, managed by Alexander Gorwuth, and ours uh, from FAPESPI. Our just got online. Both of them connected to a network called BITNET. In addition to BITNET, there was HAPNET. It was a high-energy physics network. Everyone's so glad, traffic curves going up, emails, news groups which was something uh, unheard at for uh, University of Sao Paulo, Unicamp, University of Campinas, just attracting attention to the process. And finally, in the end of 1998, beginning of 1989, Fermi said, good, you seem to be happy, but please pay attention. But BitNet is not enough in terms of technical capability. You can only send a text or an email. We are migrating to internet. So Ferry was migrating to internet and said, good, good. We want to pick back on you. We want to go into internet as well. One of the processes to join them, especially because there was the UCP networks, is that we needed a last name, so to speak. So we asked Juan Postel, saying that as .br was available, it was part of a, an ISO table, it hadn't been allocated yet. So Postel said, good, good, you are doing okay, good, you can have .br for you. This is an agreement between network operators, the Department of Commerce, or the government. Nobody was involved. It was just an agreement among network uh, operators, providers, and we had our first DNS. And in that time, we had a meeting with Mike Constant, Gomidi, and others, and said, so what? What are we going to do about .br? Said, well, still today, just academia. So let's have academia under that .br. So USP.br, Unicom.br, because the academia has brought it on board. But it was very similar to the US, I mean, 
They had gov, we had dot gov, we are going to have dot gov dot br. They have dot net, we are going to have net dot br. They have dot org, we are going to have dot org dot br. So we created all of that, all empty categories, because there was nothing to put under it. And when we created .gov, Commit said, well, we cannot be used. We had to divide it by state. So we decided it would be state.sp.gov and so on and so forth. And .gov would be for the federal government. It was decided among three or four of us in our meeting just to have an infrastructure that would grow appropriately right from the beginning. Well, the negotiation to go to the internet that was accelerated because it was very clear that it would, it would take place. And back in 1991, we managed to get the internet connect. Bidnet was raised like that and died like so. But now, but ours had developed and the date for the first traffic when Gomid sent us an email it was February 6, 1991. That was the official internet date of uh, internet in Brazil. We had USP and RNP, they were officially open in 1989. And ECHO 1992 was a very important pressure to make use of the internet. The NPK had uh, covered costs between Sao Paulo and Rio, 2,400 bits per second, then we increased that, then 64,000 bits per second, and I remember that we tried to have a radio network there was a reporter who covered Echo 92 and she had a radio at home and it, that was the only way that she could get access to all the information and news. So UCP as electronic message and ACP, which was an excellent provider at that time, so the network would go beyond the academia, the academia. So first academia, second the civil society, third the sector, the activists, third the government, and just the fourth wave we have the tel telco companies because as SCA said, they were all committed to the ISO OZ standard X400, X500, and they were waiting for a time that it, which was a solution. We had the Telebras system at that time, and we had a hard time to convince them that they should not wait all that long. I remember several embassies that we had to talk with them. I remember Alexander in Rio de Janeiro and in Brateo in 1994 open vacancy for those that wanted to use the internet. That seemed to be a victory as in Brateo decided to put aside the ISO Aussie and moved to internet. But that was so full because now the whole Brazilian internet will have two phone numbers of a real Embratel, and to access internet, you would have to die those numbers. And then the minister, Sergio Mota, we said that, that was good, but not so good. So we want you to change that, and so he did in March. 95 with a new decree saying that Embratel should bring internet that they were not allowed to give that to telcos and telcos would be responsible to give access to the end users and after the overturn of that done by the minister now we had a number, a set of providers, and most of them related to communication, means to the media, and all that content in Portuguese, which seems to be so rare 
everything was in English. If you couldn't read or uh, English, there was nothing you could do in the network. And a virtual network was uh, raised in Brazil in face of the worldwide internet. I remember a round of interviews with Sergio Mota and someone asked him, how about internet? I am a communication minister. That has to do with my daughter, with academia. But that led to a LGT, communications law, which was not regulated, did not require any license. You didn't need any specific license, so we have to be careful and not lose those achievements which are quite old, it dates from the 90s, and we have to keep that spirit of the internet. And these are very relevant features. So we have to highlight and point out all these communication uh, histories. The Internet of Fame, Hall of Fame, it's important to have those players, and that was a multi-sectorial process, and such a multi-stakeholder aspect is part of the first CG where we have non-elected representatives yet. Representatives, Sierra Mera, he represented users. We had uh, the industry being represented by some other players. We had providers, we had Abranet. So with nine uh, players, that was a multi-stakeholder framework already at that time. And the goal was to guide the internet development. And before I close this first round of my talk, that was a political initiative, as BR at that time was free of charge until 1997, just in 1997 when it was decided that it should be all too sustainable. And NIC, which is the continuity of the Brazilian registry since in 1999, as there was no continuity solution, and on the country that became a expenditure source as we had to pay for employees and each agency should pay for their own expenditures. We had no budget for that. We had to go to a meeting at our federal capital. Someone would have to cover those expenses, maybe FAPESP, so we could participate at those meetings at our federal capital. And that changes completely once BR is charged. That was decided in 1997, but it took a while, and just around the 99, we managed to get a super avid, and then in the beginning of the year 2000s, we have a data center separated from FAPESP. First resources, they were deposited at FAPESP, and at the end of uh, Mr. Ivan's campus management, who was in, in instrumental for the um, composition of CGI. And Ivan Campos suggested that that group should have a legal framework and Nick got, uh, became a company in 2003 that was not activated as CGI decided to wait for the new government to become uh, active. We waited for the civil society members to be elected. We had a meeting in a barbecue restaurant where the prior Nick founders with the new Nick founders, they got together to revise the whole process. That CNPJ corporate number became the same one, and we decided to activate that. And finally, in 2005, Rogério Santana, who was the CGI current, who was the CGI coordinator at that time, we decided that the FAPESP count 
with the sum left of resources from 2005 and that flow that was deposited at a FAPESP uh, account, such resources, they were taken back to Nick Biar, and then finally Nick Biar ultimately became responsible for all the actions with independent resources. That was the whole chain which led us to become what we are today. .br is a well-seen domain. And as Christina said, we have a number of interesting activities such as broadband measurement, IX, uh, point of traffic, internet exchange traffic, I should say. We have uh, OECD statistics management, IPv6 technical workshops. We have uh, the podcasts, a number of uh, different activities that uh, are that were just possible thanks to our financial autonomy mm -hmm. thanks to our autonomy in managing our dot br and the services that the registry offers and that uh, a charge has uh, some payments responsible to drive a super avid and that became a model which many other countries envy a lot and as Carlos Alberto said, we have to preserve all those concepts, especially those 10 uh, chapters, principles, of course, that the world is changing. And let's not forget about, about our security team, as security is indeed an issue. And let's not take the security risks to put apart all our important concept pillars. Security is key, privacy on the other hand as well, and everyone should coexist in harmony. So if uh, these were my first insights, that's it for now. I thank you, Christina. Well, then, while you were talking, I was going back in time, and I if I remember about the public campaign for Mora Campus to be part of ICON. Indeed, and he was one of the first elected ICON directors. Remember that? Yes, I do. And that uh, that uh, timeline, uh, it was uh, wonderful to see that uh, technical issues they are intertwined to political issues where we try to balance and to protect freedom as such a dichotomy of uh, private safety and public safety or security could impair an infrastructure which is present at everyone's lives. Now I hand over to Professor Glaser. If you could address about our own resources. FAPESP had to take resources or turn resources to NIC to be able to deploy those resources on behalf of the network to make them more active, safer, and not only, but to be a very important player to IGF, internet, uh, to important international global governance forums, also the worldwide internet, uh, all of that uh, just became possible thanks to our multi-stakeholder model with all society players being part of all these endeavors. Of course, you are totally right. Thank you and good morning to all of you. And I'm so glad to tackle upon all these important details. Some of them have already been addressed by my colleagues here. While working at Poly, the engineering school, I was university, I should say, I was responsible to deploy internet infrastructure at the University of Sao Paulo campus, where our university has some sort of representation. At that time, I was working at Polytechnic uh, uh, Steering Committee. 
and I was responsible to manage internet infrastructure for the University of Sao Paulo as a whole and the engineering university of the University of Sao Paulo. When I concluded that back in the 90s, Demi decided to leave FAPESP. And as a coincidence, Professor Romeo Landi was elected, was appointed as the new president of FAPESP. And he took me to FAPESP as his advisor and assessor. And I was, I became liable to coordinate the academic network of the state of Sao Paulo, ANSP network, which became a few years before. Data mining was my first activity. I had to find out about a number of issues as Demi was no longer there. Demi was working for a different agency, the agency of the state of Sao Paulo, and I had just left Politecnica. I was now working for FAPESP, and I found out that there was a embryon in the FAPESP network that was operating the dot BR. And the first question that I had during Professor Lange's management was, how can we sustain, how can we manage resources like that, resources that are stepping out the academic network, resources that are devoted to the state of Sao Paulo, which are now supporting the Brazilian internet. And Demi kind of solved that issue, but yet we had some FAPESP links with the lab waiting for some decisions, government decisions, considering that there was a proposal to charge a reduced reduced costs to the academia. However, that was not regulated yet, and FAPESP had not covered, they covered their international links. Therefore, we had to pay for such a debt, and FAPESP was questioning with the new direct directors. And somehow, with our first meeting with the Internet Committee, and that was the first first time that I got together with the CGI committee and to understand at what extent would that domain management be free of charge. And together with some other countries, it came up to our minds to charge uh, annual maintenance fee to the internet. That decision was made and that led to a second problem. How can we, as a public agency, without uh, any profits, NGO, how can we get money from hundreds, thousands, and millions domain owners? Together with some university teams, we developed some projects that could get additional resources by service providers as long as that was regulated and approved by all university levels. And the same proposal was taken to FAPESP and we were able to build up an structure with a specific account, current account, to be able to get those resources that were paid by the domain owners throughout dot .br domain. And in 1997, as Demi has mentioned, we developed a software which would help us to manage all domain names where we had approximately, by the end of the 90s, uh, 13,000 domains in Brazil. With those 30,000 domains, we decided to register again those domains to know exactly who was part of that domain. 
and throughout that massive register, we were able to charge annually a certain amount to maintain such a register as part of the Brazilian internet domain. And those that were complying with that new agreement, they would be they would agree with that sort of payment. That was a turnover where in 1998 we started charging and out of those 30,000, 27,000 of those owners, they agreed to pay to keep their name registered under a domain. And little by little, such payments, they were responsible to create a fund where CGI or Nick BR, not as a corporate, but just as part of a project, could have their own resources. And internally at FAPESP, we divided the UNSPI network as a project, but no longer now as a CGI, but rather as a project called the administration of a domain name and both projects under my coordination, but each one of them with their own private resources. UNSPI getting their resources sources from FAPESP and the domain names management counting on their own resources. In the beginning, of course, we had the little resources, but slowly that increased and we were able to have our own team, our own structure. And in 2002, we were able to have our own premises, and with that, we were able to have our stable, fixed premises with our own team, with those that used to work for FAPESP, but now they were allocated to work specifically and devoted their times for domains with the systems devoted by PREDS, all of them registered with updated information and data. In 1997, there were 30,000. In 1998, 70,000. In 1999, 150,000. So during three or four years, we doubled the domain names, showing that we were at the right time, providing everything into a computer system and providing a much more modern infrastructure. Everything monitored under CGI. I have to say that uh, it was great to be supported by CGI to really implement an autonomous structure which no longer depended on resources provided by other agencies, being really self-sustained. It was a very good phase uh, of our work. We moved to a different venue. We had 30 full-time people working at uh, NIT. .br with resources which were managed by FAPESP, but as part of a project that I coordinated, giving me full autonomy to uh, organize everything, including paying uh, travel uh, expenses, because we had our own resources. We could pay CGI and we could also start being represented internationally. I remember a trip with Ivan Mora Campos and we being able to be there actively representing our structure. So Brazil took an active role in the world internet. Then in 2003, with the new government, a lot had changed. A new decree just increased the multi-stakeholder representation, which is extremely uh, important till today. And in 2005, when all resources coming from domain names were exclusively allocated to a NIC.br dedicated a corporate there was, let's say, a friendly rupture between FAPESP and uh, CGI. Today, we are fully autonomous unit. And the main difference between my time when I joined FAPESP, which was to create a solid, robust, reliable structure for managing and for providing infrastructure, whereas today, 
CGI and Nick.br has multiple activity centers mentioned before, including uh, security statistics, internet apps, engineering, measurement of traffic exchange points, quality, everything executed with the same source of resources. So what started just to create an infrastructure for domain name is something that supports a very large structure. Today, there are over 200 people working at NIC.br providing exemplary internet quality, not only to Brazil, but which serves as a model and as an inspiration for other countries as well. We have partnerships, we exchange information with different countries, we have secondary servers, in different countries throughout the world. All of that providing appropriate security and confidentiality of data to our infrastructure, our network and internet in Brazil. We have all domains of Korea, all domains of Germany and other countries allocated at NIC BR. And the other way around, we have partnerships with different countries really providing safety, security, and stability in Brazilian internet. I haven't been a pioneer, but I have been part of this history, even though Carlos Alberto is uh, somewhat older than, uh, than I, but I had really the privilege of uh, being part of the transition, providing a structure which I believe to be stable, reliable, that really puts Brazil in a leadership position. Thank you very much. And if I will, I'm given the chance, I can add some comments later. Thank you. Thank you. It is resilient, stable, and reliable. People have no idea how much work it takes behind the scenes to transform internet into something resilient. Especially now, considering everything that we've been through, Internet's helping us work, purchase things which make us our day be feasible and better. We are having teleconsultation with our doctors. So the internet has a number of uses. And had it been for this story and the whole journey, we wouldn't be here today. But we still have got uh, challenges. We have seen in retrospective everything that we've done. And now I'd like to look ahead. I believe we still have got a number of challenges. First of all, have internet governance understood by the whole population. We still seem to be in a bubble. Some people who understand how internet works and why it's important to be multi-stakeholder. Secondly, representativeness. I think we have to revisit representativeness and maybe expand it a little bit, maybe include some new players. I don't know how we would like how we could do it, but I would like to hear you on it. Thirdly, something that we've been seeing, which is the Balkan transformation of internet. It comes from geopolitical issues as well as technical issues. And it seems to have other ways of using internet and coming to us. So we have internet of things, we had the mobile phones, and this is somewhat different from what you had said so far. And this is perceived by people as being internet. So the whole balkanization process is something really important. People think they're using internet, but well, uh, there's much broader internet than we can see. When we brought IPv6 as equation of IP with uh, higher numbers, it had to do with more devices getting connected to the network, some of them exchanging data one with the other without going through 
any uh, basic network. So without going through a domain name, there are still things that are happening, that are uh, happening now, will happen and may impact internet governance. So I'd like to hear from you, in from your opinion, what are the main challenges? And how that can help us face this Challenges. So, CA, you go first. Well, okay. I think Cristina has brought some crucial issues for our discussion. Some challenges that uh, go beyond frontiers or barriers. A decision in one country may, in fact, may affect decisions in another country. Sharing through electromagnetic wave without coming to a consensus. So this is a huge number of things happening that have to be addressed and really brought to a consensus. But I have another point to make. The pandemic, digamos, Something that has got even more momentum thanks to the pandemic. We have a wonderful communication tool, it's a trans frontier uh, tool that has really reached a, an excellent level. It's multimedia, it provides interaction. Of course, it does involve a number of information security, which is an important point to be discussed internationally as well. But Brazil has a structure of internet which has been supported by uh, Nick.br, which is the traffic exchange points and optimized traffic exchange in the country. But we still are not there at the end. IGF is going to approve what they call a policy network. It will be one of the main discussions of the Internet Governance Forum about meaningful assets, as they call it, Unif uh, universal access with quality. And people, family, do not have appropriate connectivity to work from home or to make their children study uh, from home using remote resources. And it's a reality not only in old areas in uh, some states, but sometimes even in the countryside area of a state such as São Paulo. There is a crucial problem, which is the strategy of universalization and a qualification to do it. We really have fantastic conditions to do so. But, however, we don't have a strategy to, in the short term, ensure appropriate connection to all public schools or ensure appropriate connection to all public health care centers and provide appropriate connection to all households. Since internet started, we've been trying to universalize broadband. All plans have failed. And this is a core responsibility not only of the federal government, but also local government, because there is a lot a local government can do. It concerns local regulatory issues, allowing, for example, cable transmission, as well as encouraging the creation of uh, wireless networks in the city and so on and so forth. And the same applies to state government. So it's something which should not only be in the hands of the federal government. Of course, the federal government has a role to play because there are some federal networks of, well, let's say, social service provision that also have to be met. COVID pandemic has emphasized that. 
Christina has said that at first we were concerned more with the infrastructure, whereas today we have to consider about the top layers, the app, social network, and the risks involved in, let's say, interference in elections, for example. But I think that ubiquity of the infrastructure is equally important. Having the most powerful traffic exchange point doesn't mean that all families in São Paulo are properly connected, quite to the contrary, let alone in other regions of the country. So what I would like to suggest as a point for discussion at CGI, and I would like to uh, recall Demi and uh, Migon, uh, to take that to the attention of their boards. Nick.br has to use the resources available. Because in the past, resources used to be uh, used for international events, and today there is no need anymore. So these resources should be used for a bidding uh, open for quality propositions for a effective universalization of the internet in the country so that we can really deal with upcoming disasters and pandemic with a more equal distribution of internet access. Wonderful, thank you. I had promised them uh, that we wouldn't go into universalization, but as you brought it to the table, I think this is really important because on the fringes of large cities and especially within large cities in areas where we cannot take telecom infrastructure, many people were left outside uh, the interaction through internet it, uh, for studying, for selling products and services. So we still have a problem in our country. We have a country which is not really uh, even, it has a very uneven distribution. Let me make a comment. There is a process in our 5,570 cities towards digitalization. Government services at all levels that are provided through digital systems and the society should be able to have access to that with good connect, uh, connectivity. So once providing and migrating the services, they have to make sure that the populations have access. This is also an element that really makes us uh, try to come up with a strategy of universalization. Wonderful. I believe we still have got a lot to do to come up with new connectivity uh, options. We can have the private initiative on board. We can have incentives for universities to once again come up with solutions as uh, they did in the past by coming up with IP so that we can have master networks or other kind of network infrastructure to really provide access to as many people as they require it. Demi? Thank you, Christina. So let me go back to the technical portion of it, because I have a number of concerns. Internet is called because of Internet Protocol. When the Internet Protocol was created, it was a division of TCP IP. So Internet Protocol is the glue, so to speak, among the network. So it's a network that uh, started from the patchwork of many networks which are interrelated. In addition, there is a point-to-point -point connection. So I I am, I, wherever I am, I can talk to another side. This is also neutrality and all the names you know. So what are the risks uh, concerning the future? 
So we have the IP, the main core of the process, the layer on which internet runs, and there are some risks underneath and above them. Let me start with the risks underneath it. Maybe not severe, but still risks. When we transform IP over in optic fiber, fine. There is no personality in terms of what goes through. If you transport IP over a 5G mobile network, the 5G network might have some privileged channels. It might impact communication. It is loading IP, so one with more priority, second one without priority. So when you have an IP running over other layers that have intelligence of their own methods, it may impact what was the origin of the process, neutrality. Maybe there are some privileges that are being exercised in the IP, uh, the layer under IP, because something had been defined at this level. Let's get those risks above. I consider that Internet is what is concentrated over IP. So end-to-end -end communication, which is key, it was almost forgotten once we have those large uh, apps. We consider that apps, they work over Internet, such as the web, which is an app, which is a, our an app working over the web, but this is not the internet, but rather apps. If you have an app which does not behave well, or if it behaves uh, badly, but that uh, agency does not like this or that, or maybe that app may be prohibited in an area, but not in another one. So if you do something, if you change internet apps at a higher level that may be negative in a certain level, but that will not affect the bulk of the internet. Internet does not depend on working equally at all levels of the internet everywhere. And some levels of the internet, they may uh, make changes in upper or lower levels if that will make changes in the neutrality what may represent a risk in that bulk analysis if that is uh, represents a risk. There is a proposal for a new IP. This is a proposal that is being discussed in the IOT. The old IP and the new IP, we have here two different things. And I do not know what drives the idea of the new IP, if it's a more control, more surveillance. Well, that's not the reason. What really matters is if you will be able to camadas médias da rede que são as fundamentais. The uh, internet connectivity. We have a single internet, non-balkanized, with higher levels. And if you switch that, if you change that, that may lead to an internet rupture. So that discussion of balkanization, I would not fear discussion balkanization of those apps that were prohibited or not, but rather to discuss about the the dissemination of the internet structure. If you place some obstacles in its structure, you may cause in that rupture, which I had mentioned. The idea is to go back to that distributed idea of internet to avoid those concentration centers which generate too much attention or focus, which may be interpreted as internet rupture or something like that. So we should understand what is internet and what comes above or below it and to represent the central internet and to know that whatever comes in the upper or lower level may differ and also their use. That's perfect. Thank you, uh, Professor Demi. I do agree to Carlos Alberto and to Demi 
comments. However, my main concern has to do with deploying our knowledge, expertise, and that's why we raised new resources. That's why we foster resource capacity building. That is still a treasure which is within a bubble, as Christina said, and we have to do our best to contaminate and to reach others. And my big dream, and this is an offline information, today we will start our first post-graduation CGI NIC uh, course in partnership with the advanced uh, studies of uh, NIC, BR, and USP, the University of uh, Sao Paulo. And we have uh, that course, uh, and we are paying an honor to Oscar Salas, who was my uh, instructor. And we have uh, that uh, room, which are the 10 chapters, where we have that uh, post-graduation course that was raised is the over CGI that was just the main seat of that graduation course and that works as a transversal post-graduation course to any other course. Steve Croker, he's one of the fathers of the internet and he will be the first professor to address a talk in this post-graduation course which will add credits. That's not an open course, but that is a consequence of EGI and CGI. The idea behind that is to use our skills of training, capacity building, to give that look towards the future. And that does not work just for, for the academic but rather to understand that this multi-stakeholder model is key. Some sectors, they are highly engaged, but not all sectors. And sometimes I find so difficult to sell that model, that multi-stakeholder model to the government, and we are not the government ourselves. The CGI cannot propose loss. What we do is to recommend and the governmental representatives at CGI, we just uh, propose those new models to the agencies, and there is room for that. The multi stakeholder model will benefit or will depend on those benefits, and that requires a mature discussion between the telco and providers. And we do have enough room to keep that multi-stakeholder philosophy and to reach a consensus. We better wait more than to speed up any decisions. We talk in the guiding principles of the internet, which took us three to four years to consolidate such guiding principles. And it took us another five to six years to reach the civil uh, structure of internet. So we are going to, it's going to take a while or it took a while to reach that legal framework to have an open internet as it is. And we had just created the National Data Protection Authority. For 12 or 13 years, CGI carries out the annual privacy and data protection seminar, which is a consequence of an internal discussion that we have for more than 10 years, and that shows how CGI may collaborate. And I don't want it to be a fortune teller, but this is the sense that I wanted to share and how I would like to collaborate. I am one of the oldest ones here in this group, and Demi will follow me and will keep on organizing more activities with more competence with a new team. We do need people with is willing to do their best and while we can, we are going to do our best. Well, 
you, the three of you, know that the NIC succession and CGI, we, it's, it has always been a concern. We are all getting older. We have all been working for over 25 or 30 years, and we are not going to last forever. So we have to take that legacy ahead. We have to understand that others will come after us. Succession is part of our legacy, and we have to take to new generations everything that we did, everything that we still can do next. And with that idea in mind, I would like to raise another discussion. Once, once you say that there are several sectors at different instances, such as the legal, legislative, we don't have enough information or knowledge about what Internet is, in fact, what are those uh, transversal ideas in terms of universal access and to make that universality of access, allowing access to all. And I had followed all those forums that led to the general data protection law, but to have a LGPD that was just the first steps of that long pathway, and we still have much more to do, and that requires important discussion forums. And how can we take that current governance framework and that structure, power division, what can we do to address all those issues? I know that this uh, is a quite polemic aspect, but as we are in a forum addressing challenges in the internet governance issues, there is no way to address that topic without including a greater representativity. Let me tell you that CGI is towards that aim, and the idea is to develop theme chambers. Those chambers, they are divided by different topics. They all embrace a multi-sectorial formats with 16 representatives from different sectors, and we insist that those entities which are already part of CGI, they are kept and we are inviting other sectors which are not yet part of the internet scope. They are being invited to be part of this new management approach and our coordinators, they are so motivated to turn those chambers as discussion forums. Chambers, they won't be autonomous for decision uh, purpose, but they will be a forums for brainstorm to discuss and to take those ideas to CGI and to render some suggestions and ideas. So we'll have a number of representatives from different sectors, always representing or uh, following that multi-stakeholder format. So it's high time that we revise our principle, our guiding principles, I should say. Don't you agree? Well, Cristina, she, Olha, Cristina, kind, she likes to be quite uh, controversial and provocative, I would say. Well, after two years of discussion within the CGI, and why it took so long? That was a multi-stakeholder process, and we wanted to have that approved by a consensus, a consensus of all sectors, and that's why it took two years. 
Não é assim que se descreve esse, um, uh, esse princípio. We, we had to revise a number of times isso, different principles because maybe one principle would uh, impair a então, principle that um was not according to our ideas. Therefore, it was a well-designed work that elaborated the principle leading to that uh, legal framework that took from 2009 to 2014 to be be authorized and to be no approved, as we had to rely em, on em, a full consensus. And since the legal framework mundial, sanctioned in the coisa, worldwide uh, meeting 2014, some civil society sectors did not comply with that legal framework. They didn't accept it for our surprise. And after a while, they understood about its importance and they agreed that mas, that was exactly what we had to do at that time. And how about about now. O, o próprio marco civil. Em termos It is understood, I understood that, that legal framework it requires some uh, adjustments as, as we are dealing with the dynamic internet. We have to revise some of those principles então, that have been outdated by now. So we have to analyze and we have to revise. A prior revision has been done, but we do have to keep doing that in a careful manner as all those processes to be for being a prior reference in an international level that had required too much responsible effort. Therefore, any sort of change should follow all this strict and careful evaluation to understand and to revise exactly where exactly exactly those principles should be changed, which articles should be considered, what are the chapters that should be revised. In the last publication of that magazine, there is a wonderful publication of a number of interviews addressing that same question, and that works as a reference for this work that we are suggesting now. Well, I advocate for those uh, guiding principles. I know that this culture changes, the environment and everything else, but not principles. And I fear changing principles as they are based on human freedom, human rights, and so on. The main problem of legal framework and guiding principles is because they were not well understood by many. The legal framework was criticized by many once that was released. Many Many, they would say that uh, that was monitored because there was access log, whereas there were others saying that the, that lacked uh, of uh, monitoring. So what I would say for guiding principles is that we may refine those, of course, to make those uh, principles uh, better understood and to turn them more clear to all. But they express truth to human being. If a human being has not changed, how are we going to change things drastically? Let me just exemplify. There is that famous sentence, if you open your freedom in a position to safety, you are not going to offer neither, none of them. So you are all facing the anxiety for fake news, malware, attacks, we will run the risk to change the core structure of the process, which is a concept structure. For example, a rope is an excellent tool. You can uh, just help someone who is strong. You can also use it to create a hanger. I'm not going to say no rope can be allowed because someone may be hung. No. So internet has a number of situations in which it, it's bothersome, but not the internet. The problem are the people who are uh, have ill intention. So eliminating a rope because it had been used to be hung, hung someone is a terrible idea. 
I am a romantic, you see, but I believe that we have to preserve the concept of the 10 principles. We have to improve them to become even clearer and maybe discuss if any of them have lost its importance. In my opinion, none of them has. So what kind of intermediates are, well, uh, are immune? So the rope should not be blamed for someone being hung. The, someone who has tied a knot and that has made someone be hung, okay, that person is to be uh, blamed. So uh, what has been defined as intermediate should be revealed. I liked your quotation. Barlon, for example, because Barlon has taken me to internet. In an international event, he told me, well, a journalist who has no access with an email and internet access will be going out of job within six months. And I believe that. <laughs> and then I went uh, to Carlos Alberto said, I need access, please. But yesterday I was reading about a discussion and I tried to join but could not of someone saying that it was an utopia, what Barlin has said of uh, cyberspace freedom, and said it's not, all the liberties are still there, and we have to advocate for them. I don't think it's an utopia. But uh, don't we like utopia? Well, we do. But we have to analyze more to utopia, uh, just focus more on utopia than on surveillance. But thank you, very good reference you made. Professor Glasser, along the same lines of my two predecessors, I think principles are principles, period. And we should not deal with them. Well, as internet is creative, and we are always uh, searching for new uses, maybe rather than having a 10 principle, maybe we can go into one or two more principles encompassing something new. But provided that it's a consensus, provided that it's a mature, deep discussion, and without going into conflict with what we already have. If I recall collecti uh, correctly, in 2015, Bashaya was in the Ministry of Communication, coordinated a public hearing in Brasilia, and he divided the group. It was a multi-stakeholder meeting. And they uh, just broke out into groups, and I was in one of them. And they asked me, uh, uh, they asked me to advocate for the ten principles. And maybe I was a bit rude, but I said, "Well, stop it! If you don't accept the ten commandments of internet, you are going to hell." Maybe I was a bit too rude. But, well, that made them get interested into our ten principles. I agree with Demi. There are still ten people, uh, some people who have not read the principles, not even the legislation. People only read what they like, what they want, because it's in favor of their position. So we have to review, study, and maybe this is why CGI has a very important role. I can see that we can include maybe something new in the principles, provided that we are respecting the consensus and the principles of something that had been built right from its beginning, counting on the participation of everyone. Building a consensus is not easy. Not even in small forums such as CGI and, of course, uh, the legislative uh, branch, uh, we tend to have sometimes possible laws, not exactly the optimal laws because of the need for consensus. But this is the world where we live. We will have to keep on fighting for consensus and I hope we succeed. There is one question asked by the audience, which is related with resilience of internet and everything that we have addressed. 
and also the traffic exchange points. It's a question probably to you, Demi, but I'm going to open to all of you. Is there a possibility of our uh, internet exchange points have CDNs in the main content providers? I know it is something that I've seen people wanting to have an IXP within a telecom company. So I know this can be trouble, trouble ahead. So, Demi, what is the CGI's point in it? One of the main uh, services provided by IXP is to take content closer to users. So, on the one side, it just uh, has users and can collect and deliver. So, there is an exchange of content. So, content is absolutely essential in IXP. The, the network does not only bring content, it can house, it can host one. And we've seen that in the IXP of Sao Paulo uh, and Fortaleza. So contact to be delivered through IXP. And Nick.pr and uh, CGI also approves, and there is a pilot running in uh, Salvador, it's an open CDN. What, what is it? In areas where there is not that huge traffic, those who have contact do not try to have a cache uh, for the content to be readily available by users. Manaus, a typical case. Connection is still poor there, and there is no content which has moved its cache into Manaus. So our initiative is the following. We create a consortium and we help create contents there so that providers from there don't have to come all the way to Sao Paulo, Rio or Fortaleza. This is a very important initiative to decentralize. Why in Sao Paulo we have the largest IXP? Well, there's a lot of contacts. So someone from a provider from any state pays a connection to Sao Paulo to get the content that is found here in a source. If the source was available, the content was available somewhere else, they wouldn't have to get all the way to Sao Paulo. They could have the IXP of a, a, a much closer uh, IXP. So this is what we've been trying to create. Consortia, which does not generate additional cost to NIC.br. The cost is shared by those uh, who are uh, benefited by that. So rather than coming to Sao Paulo to get contact, that provider can and uh, resort to some more localized. This is open CDN. It has been in operation for three or th two or three years. Salvador is our first experimental project. Now Manaus is going into operation. And I believe it's going to be a good solution to have a decentralized network. Because if it's fully centralized, it's never a good idea. We want to go back to the idea of distributed internet throughout the world. If it concentrates, uh, exaggerates, if it exaggerates concentration, it also adds to a possibility of risks or other uh, attacks as well. Anything to add? Not really. Perfect. But I would like to ask to you, Demi, what is the importance of IXP? Because I believe there are people here who do not know how important they are. Open CDN means open network that delivers uh, content. Describing exactly what Danny has said. Let me talk about internet exchange uh, points. So local providers of service and contact can exchange information without having too far. So let's say University of Sao Paulo that has to connect to internet. So hire a, a, a line provider, X megabits uh, for internet, and you go to China, Germany, France, and also to cross the street and talk to Folha de Sao Paulo, State of Sao Paulo, or Unicamp. So I'm paying the same amount to access anywhere in the world and also here. What if we had some uh, closer relationships here? 
maybe that can be excluded from or discounted so the uh, from the total account so everyone who's here in sao paulo can exchange traffic at low cost because you end up uh, uh, bumping into people so to speak IXP means rather than hiring a generic connection that takes uh, anywhere in the world, you still have to hire it, fine. But then all your local connections can be done locally. So the internet exchange point is a way of get in agreement with your local providers so that you solve that at low cost, high reliability, low cost without traveling around. If there were no IXP, they would have to go all the way to Miami and come back. So why have an internet connection uh, and exchange traffic throughout the world if we are in the same city and we can exchange traffic locally? And at first, at the network, it was exactly like that. To talk to globe, to Alternex, we had to go all the way to Miami and the rest and then come back, right? I don't know if I'm right, Demi, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I like to talk about Netflix. Netflix needs good network quality. So the closer it is to my quality, the better. If Netflix server is in Sao Paulo and I am so far away, I wish it were closer in my region. And it's in Sao Paulo and not anywhere else. Well, we are getting to the end of our morning here today. But before summing up what we've discussed here, I would like to ask the three of you to uh, just give us your uh, take-home message for all of those who are going to be with us for the next seven meetings. Seven meetings. Okay. Carlos Alberto, go first. Please move on. Keep on following closely the process. It's interesting to be closely with some international processes, if possible. Video. Okay, good. Há um esforço para. Internationally, the discussion should be universal. It has been done through the organization of national uh, internet governance forum. Brazil is a pioneer, of course, with the Brazilian Forum of Internet Governance, and these forums are also organized regionally. We talk about that bringing the problems of internet governance or internet management that the countries have to discussion. And then IGF, through 20 dynamic coalitions maintained throughout the year, the topics are brought to discussion. So opportunities are given. You just have to try to participate, and everyone's participation is absolutely essential. So that was my closing remarks. Thank you. Demi? So let me talk about the universal internet governance discussion. It should be a discussion where you can listen to everyone's concern. And it should be something, uh, of course, based on reality. So uh, the physical, technical limitations and the needs of users. You have given an excellent example. Kishram Obin's people, they want to have better access to Netflix. So how can you do that? By migrating data to the region. So we have to listen to the requests and complaints and at the same time wait against the technical solutions. So this is why we need a multi-stakeholder approach. We had to be open to all possibilities and, and be aware of things that can be done and see uh, how to come up with proposals that can really meet the needs of people. So, of course, discussion governance 
is impossible, is important, I mean, and bring on board all the needs, demands, so that we can have an internet that is really uh, mindful of what people need. When we started, I said that we have to understand the basic principles of internet. At the same time, it's equally important to have everyone involved in the negotiation. Not only internet specialists, it's really all the apps. And I would like to invite all participants to be part of the forums offered by CGI at all different levels. There is a Brazilian forum of internet governance. This year will be provided once again online. But the whole infrastructure is ready. So please contact CGI.br. We have information available. There is also a seminar on data privacy, the week of technology, and a number of other seminars and conferences talking about IPv6, about IXP. CGI has a myriad of options that can be used to help you get involved. And who are the players? All of us. All of us. We are all internet users. So to some extent, all of you who are attending today, you are invited to participate as part of this dynamic multi-stakeholder discussion, contributing with your expertise, your insights, and also your criticism. And together, we can keep on building an open, resilient, good, reliable internet to all of us. Thank you very much as Executive Secretary of the seminar. Thank you very much, Christina, for your great moderation. And with that, I hand it back to you. Thank you. An open, distributed, free internet. It has to be free. And we haven't been using this word. I know that you haven't used the word free, but I think we need to use free from freedom, right? This is something important to point out. Uh, the, uh, a free internet in terms of freedom. We have really uh, traveled through multi-stakeholder uh, practices and we have seen the history of the creation of network and how important it was to have it built based on consensus. And also many players got together, uh, some of them with conflicting interests, but to some extent they realized there was only one way to take that met everyone's needs, and by doing that, they transformed internet in Brazil what it is today. Right now, when we are uh, creating a new space for decision-making, for representation, for everything that we've been through in terms of internet use changes, we have also talked about the challenges ahead. The history of creating a consensus, of having internal discussion is gone. Sometimes we wanted to give visibility to that. You probably, uh, Carlos, understand, and I said, Tata, where are you? I need to talk to you. And I said publicly in the newspaper, if you get uh, the, uh, what I wrote uh, in the past, because I wanted to give answers to internet users, and I could not at that time, and internet users uh, were technicians, someone who knew about computer and wanted to do whatever it took to get a connection. Today, if it takes two minutes to have access to Netflix, we complain like hell, you know? Say, how come horrible internet? It's not, believe me. We really have to understand how internet works to understand all the paths behind it, which make traffic being better in one region and worse in the other region. So I think universalization is also a topic brought by Carlos Alberto, which is something that gains more and more important. 
If we have infrastructure which is not available to everyone, even though we don't even have uh, uh, sanitation available to everyone, even though we don't even have electricity available to everyone in Brazil, we really have to keep on advocating for that because social and economic and educational developing the country depends on good internet connection and good exchanges not below the IP layer. The IP layer, I, IP layer, I just live on your hands. But of course, we have layers above IP and we have to keep on encouraging discussion. Thank you so much, Carlos Alberto, Demi, Glasser. I hope it had been a good experience to all of that. This is something that has changed my life. I became an internet journalist thanks to that working in the network and I left uh, regular traditional media and joined online uh, inter media vehicles because I believed that the news would be discussed in this level and not in the others. That's it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.